Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Kermit Lynch Wine Merchant. Learn more at KermitLynch.com. This week on Meet and 3, we celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month with an episode about memory. I've always read and sort of approached cookbooks for more than the recipes. To me, they are full of narrative content and narrative value. So Malama Aina basically means to take care of the land. For us as Hawaiians, it's taking care of our older sibling. But I do remember like definitely feeling like self-conscious about it, like being the only one who kind of wasn't eating a sandwich and like didn't have a bag of goldfish or Lunchables. Listen to Meet and 3 wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. This is Tuesday, May 25th, 2021, and we're reporting. It's almost Memorial Day weekend, and of course, we're thinking about grilling and slow and slow barbecue. Um, But what should we pair with that? We always think beer and and more so cider. So we're going to talk to two brewers and one cookbook author. So we're going to introduce the guests here. Um, Let's start with Ray. Hey, I'm Ray Sheehan. I'm the creator of Barbecue Buddha, and I'm calling in from New Egypt, New Jersey. That's great. And one of our brewers, Paul. I'm Paul Delugokinski, Blind Bat Brewery, Centerport, Long Island, New York. Okay, and Todd. Hey there, I'm Todd DiMatteo from uh, Good Word Brewing and Public House in Duluth, Georgia. Thanks for having me. Okay, so this episode started about a month or two ago when Paul at Blind Bat Brewery. You posted about your grilled hanger steak with your hell smoke porter. Now, when I think about going out and destination breweries, Blind Bat has always been for me for 10 years, you've always making the freshest local beer, and I want to drink it as close to the source as I can. So I'm always interested to, to think about how you're now that you have your tap room the last two years, how uh, your beer pairings are going. So Tell us a little bit about your food program at, at Blind Bat Brewery out in Long Island. Yeah, we, uh, we were not allowed to open just a straight-up uh, tap room by the town, but they said we could open a small restaurant, which actually worked out with our original plans. We just weren't going to tackle that right away. But um, So we do as much organic and local as possible when we're sourcing our foods. And... Um, we try to incorporate beer when we can in the cooking of the foods. We're doing that more and more. So what you saw on Instagram was a uh, part of the marinade. I had our hell smoke porter for that uh, hanger steak. And we're going to be doing that again. It was a special. We're probably switching over to flank or skirt. But we also do um, use our Hefeweizen as part of the marinade for our chicken thighs, for our duck fat fried chicken sandwiches. Um, sometimes if we're doing our hot dogs. We like the Brooklyn hot dogs cause they're really good yeah. quality. So hot when dogs you're using and, beer as a marinade, just a, just yeah. a quick intro. What, sure. Just tell us what, what's a simple recipe for a beer marinade? 
for the, for the steak. The, oh, the simplest, you know, the simplest recipe that I've been doing it has been for the chicken. It's really just uh, maybe uh, one part of our hefeweizen to one part of a uh, pickle brine. We get pickles from a place in Glen Cove. Uh, that we use on our burgers and such, and we have an, end up with a lot of pickle brine. Uh, it's a bread and butter pickle. So we basically, that's the simplest thing I'm doing for the chicken thighs. For the for the uh, steak, it's uh, some ketchup, some molasses, some vinegar, some white cane sugar, you know, the usual suspects, uh, spices, cinnamon, cumin, um, et cetera, and then uh, a good amount of the hell small porter. And I'm gonna and a shout out if you're on Long Island, you got to get the Hell Smoke Porter from Blind Bat and also the Hefeweizen. Which last thing I knew, you, you were making it with uh, some local wheat, weren't you? Well, everything is as much New York State um, grown ingredients as possible. So um, on Long Island, it's really not much wheat or barley being grown, but we do get some hops. Everything is otherwise from upstate, the Hudson Valley, Central New York, Western New York. That's great. So great to have you back on the show. Todd, hey man, how are you? Uh, Donnie, good, good word in uh, in Georgia. Um, we had you on a show, and I, I'm always interested in in the food you're serving at your brewery. Well, I'm I'm basically looking for a job as your co-host, so I want to be on your show as much as possible. Uh, I'm just kidding, but uh, yeah, food is is a big part of what we do. You know, before I uh, before we opened Good Word, this brew pub we have. I was in restaurants for uh, the last, you know, almost 18 years. Um, so yeah, we have our chef and our sous chef. Um, you know, these, these guys kill it. I always joke and say the beer is, or the food is almost as good as the beer, but you know, some might argue that it's better. And, uh, you know, most of our beer, even though we brew lots of different styles, we kind of focus on, you know, English style beers and, uh, and lagers because they lend themselves so well to, uh, to pairings. And we actually do, Beer dinners, you know, COVID kind of put put us behind a little bit and all the rest of the world for that matter. But uh, we would do one basically every like two or three months. And funny enough, we've got our next beer dinner is next uh, Thursday. We're doing that one. You know, we'll have uh, a handful of our beers and then we'll also have our friends Blackberry Farm from uh, Maryville, Tennessee up here. So we'll have three of their beers and three of ours and we'll do uh, a welcome beer and then five courses paired up pretty dope we, like i said we're trying to get back into that rhythm but uh but yeah our our chefs kind of kill it and as far as the food goes it's kind of all across the board i was actually talking with our chef just before the show and we've got a scallop dish that i love it's got uh you know these giant seared scallops with uh, pork belly and english peas and this nice cream and he's like man the scallops pricing is going crazy it's like 30 bucks a pound what do you think about octopus and i'm like i and love octopus and then he was like well i was thinking octopus or uh or uh monkfish and i'm like shit let's put both those on the menu but like just <laughs> looking at our, just looking at our menu you know it's kind of it's kind of all over the place in some regard you know we've got the couple american standards a, a double uh patty burger and, and wings but you know we got you know pan seared trout fried uh fried chicken a mushroom croquette gnocchi and you know salads and bologna sandwich definitely has a southern feel to it um but we utilize uh, a couple of our english beers namely uh english porter and these uh roasted peanuts we use a lot of uh, a lot of beer and sauces and stuff like that too but like i said our our fan base and the regulars that come in are very used to beers that are five percent and they always want to stick around and have a couple and, and you know enjoy some some stuff to nosh on so well, it's it's spring, man, and that's that's what it feels like. And what's interesting is, um, Ray, I know you're working on a new cookbook. We're not going to talk about that too much because it's not out yet. But your first cookbook was was about all your award winning sauces, and they were really great recipes. But that seemed more like a barbecue book. But it, your new your new book seems like you're going beyond just barbecue. Yeah the the first book. Um, award-winning barbecue sauces and how to use them basically featured 10 sauces and then 50 ways to use them for grilling and smoking. Uh, whereas this one focuses on Kamado style cooking and the versatility of it. Um, you know, you can pretty much, you know, cook hot and fast, low and slow smoking, 
Um, you can roast, you can bake. So we get to break out a little bit from the barbecue mold and, um, we're not going to go too far off, but there's a lot of great different, you know, um, flavors uh incorporated into the book uh and including a really fantastic smoked queso and beer dip you know uh, i i tried it in the first book there was a, a beer brine pork chop and i i love cooking with beer so i really wanted to try to get something in this book um so, kind of simple we're, we're focusing on the basics so something like that is really quick for the um the reader to get onto the Kamado style grill to cook it. So, but yeah, definitely want to put some beer in there. Well, let's go back first. Um, your beer brine pork chop. Yes. Quick 30 seconds. How do you do that? What's that recipe? Um, I, I'll be happy to send you the exact recipe, but quickly, I mean, you know, we're doing some spices and I'm going to let it, I'm going to let this marinate for probably about eight hours. I'm going to use uh, something like more like an amber richer flavored beer that's going to really uh give it some notes of caramel and spice and um it's going to really help the exterior of of the uh pork chop get a little bit almost like um it's going to really give it more like a smoky kind of a bite to it and really it's just so simple to do just a, like I said I'm going to let it go for probably about eight hours at least. And then, yeah, so how, how does the beer interact with, is, is it, does it change the crust if you're searing it? What, yes. Yep, yeah. Tell, tell us like how the beer interacts with this piece of meat. Definitely helps. I, to me, I like to do it at a little bit of a higher heat to get a good sear on it. It really helps the crust get, um, build another layer of uh, smoky kind of flavor to it and keeping the inside really nice and moist. So if I had like a, a porter or even a, a smoke porter like like Paul makes a blind oh, bat, wow. yeah, that would really add to it. That smokiness. Since we're talking pork chops, so what's the difference between marinating with a beer based and doing it in a dry rub? Because I know you also have rubs now too, it, your, your sauce business, Barbecue Buddha. Yes. Yeah, we have uh, sauces, rubs, uh, the rubs uh, – you know, when you're doing it with a dry rub, it's kind of a, like a they, some people call it a dry brine. Like when I'm doing a brisket at a competition, I'll I'll dry brine it the night before. You know, uh, probably for a good eight or nine hours, um, and and I just think that it helps to. I don't know how deep it gets into the meat, but it it really tenderizes it, and it it you know it's not just the flavor; it's it also helps with the tenderization of it. Yeah. Hey, Todd, are you getting inspired? I don't know about inspired, but uh, absolutely hungry. <laughs> I know. I, I like when you when you started talking. I think the reason I was mentioning Ray's first book is that that was just like classic, like sauces with with you know a more barbecue dishes. But I've got a chance to look at. I'm not going to say the name of the book yet, but um, the preview of Ray's new book. And there were seafood dishes and things that stood out, which made me think that, uh, Ray, when your new book comes out, if I had a, a pub or, or, or a brewery, I would definitely use it as a resource for my menu. So, for example, you've got Maryland crab cake. Um, yeah. We love crab cakes. So w why is that in your cookbook? Because I know you're, you're, you're working with the Komodo, the ceramic style grill in, in this book. So that that made it into the book for a couple reasons. The first is really to show the versatility of the of this type of cooker. Um, they are fried on the Kamado grill. Uh, they're not just sautéed. The second is because um, th those crab cakes were awarded best crab cakes in in Delaware. Uh, we did a competition uh, every year in uh, the Delaware. Uh, they have Delaware Coast Day in Lewis, Delaware. And as part of it, they have a chowder cook-off and they have a crab cake cook-off. So we went against teams from Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, and New Jersey, and all over. And we we got first place with this crab cake. So I wanted to share that with with all the readers. You know, and and I, you know, I like to promote good food. So if people thought enough of to vote this first place, then it should be out there and people should be making it. 
So what, is there a seasoning in, in that crab cake? Or is it just about really good crab? There's, yeah, there's definitely some, some great seasonings in there. I even put my hot sauce in there um, to give it a little kick. Uh, but you, you don't want to... I, I like to uh, accentuate the, the the proteins that I'm cooking with the seasonings and the sauces as opposed to having them dominate in flavor. So I really do want you to taste that crab. You know, I, I don't want it to be overpowering with the spice or the sauce. I'd rather it be a compliment, complimentary. So let's go back to the brewer. So Todd and uh, first Todd, um, crab cake. I don't know if that inspires you or makes you hungry, but it makes me hungry. Of the beers you have coming out now, what, what would you pair with a crab cake? It's a classic, lots of crab. Yeah. So uh, first off, I love uh, crab, and you know, living in Georgia, we don't get a ton of uh, you know super fresh seafood. I don't, I don't eat seafood super often, but anytime I'm near water, I absolutely do. Um, but I would say with a uh, with crab cake, I've got a beer. It's it's called Penelope. And it's a it's a little bit higher in gravity. It's six point five percent, but it's a dry hop saison. It would fare great with a uh, with the crab uh, crab cakes, no doubt. Um, this beer <laughs> log it for about six weeks. It's super round, and I use uh, Howitzau Blanc, so it's got a bright citrusy uh, citrusness from uh, the Blanc, but it is a very subtle and nuanced beer, and uh, it wouldn't you know it would. It would pair perfectly with the crab and like maybe a light salad and a vinaigrette. Yeah, I've had crab cakes where there's just it's just so much crab meat and not much else, and um, you want to die for those. Um, Paul, for you on Long Island, yeah. I don't know if you get have crab cakes up there, but Long Island, we definitely have crab yeah. crab cakes. Uh, actually, one of the best crab cakes I ever had. Uh, a little road trip, we stopped at Mount Vernon, uh, George Washington's home, and there's a hokey kind of restaurant there. But their crab cakes were amazing. Um, as far as pairing, I, I'm working on a uh, probably be out a little later this summer a pilsner, but using Tahoma hops, which has kind of a little more of a lemon citrus aroma. Uh, I think that might go well. The hefeweizen obviously would go nicely with with crab cakes, or my, maybe my Hellas Bach also would go. Oh, that nice. sounds good too. I'll tell you about hefeweizen. Um, Years ago, when I did, I never, I don't really know too much about the science of pairing, and but I know my taste buds. And that was about twelve years ago at my at my old pub. I had some pretty noteworthy cookbook people in, and they were on to ask me about beer pairings. And I think we had some wild salmon on the menu. And I said, I I I find that German style Hefeweizen's German style wheat beers are really my go to for pairing in almost any dish. And some people call that a blanket statement, but I stand by that. I, I felt like the culture that that made German wheat beers was was very food food and beer friendly. I don't yeah. know if anyone wants to to talk about that. I'll just second it. Yeah, I would just second that motion. Uh, <clears throat> German beer is very food friendly, and uh, Hefeweizen, uh, particularly, you know, summertime. You think you're sitting outside, and maybe you're having. Uh, fried chicken or a fish dish or, you know, a lobster roll. Um, something like a Hefeweizen or a really nice Pilsner just seems to go really, really well with that. Yeah. But with your Hefeweizen, it's not just it's not just like citrus or anything. It's not like I, I can see why people like hard seltzer because they're not really tasting beer. When I think of a Hefeweizen, I think of yours. I think of wheat. It's like wheat flavor that – how do you describe the flavor of your Hefeweizen beer? Because you, you, it's it's not just like a, a light, refreshing beer. There's some flavor there. Well, I'm, I'm hoping you get the wheat because, I mean, that's the whole point, I think, of a Hefeweizen. The, the Weizen means wheat. Um, so it's I just use 50% uh, really good quality New York State wheat and uh, 50% good quality New York State barley and Use a good half of ice and yeast. If you keep the yeast happy at a good temperature, it'll it'll give you a nice beer. It's about keep at that point. It's about keeping the yeast happy. It's the yeast. That's the issue. Yeah, yeah. And then just to, in terms of serving it, because now it's like okay, everyone's get everyone's double vaxxed. They're getting out. Um, when I drink beer at your tap room, 
the, whatever it is, the carbonation, the, the way you're pouring it is perfect. Oh, thank you. What's your, I want you to comment on what you know about carbonating your beer as a brewer. Because that's the biggest issue I have with a lot of beer I'm getting. I, I, it, different bars and, and restaurants, some of them get it right. And some of it, I know when the beer comes out, it's just not tasting the way it should because of the carbonation or the the draft system. I, I, th- I mean, I, I, I haven't studied uh, formerly brewing or cooking, but I think anyone who cooks knows you, you taste it before you put it out. I think it's the same thing with beer. You, you taste it. And one of the things that you taste for is, do I feel like this is the proper level of carbonation? I know there are some, some expensive instruments that some brewers use to check the actual, you know, reading of carbonation levels. Uh, I haven't done that, not because I don't believe in it, just because I, you know, budget didn't, uh, allow for such an instrument. I think it's just a matter of, of tasting and, you keep fiddling with you things. Taste, you taste it. You're also doing really small batches, but you have an instinct uh, yeah. for it. I guess. Yeah. You, you, you can't explain it. You just know what, what you like. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's also why I love going to your place. <laughs> and then, Todd, for you, like the, these German style, like like a, a weedy Hefeweizen, go back to pairing with uh, the crab cakes. Um, do you make a Hefeweizen? You know, I, I have been wanting to do a Hefeweizen for a long time, but, uh, you know, what I would do is decoct that style, and I don't have a uh, um, a separate kettle to do that. Unfortunately, I've got a three-vessel system, and we step mash all of our beers, and it would probably make a, a good Hefeweizen, but yeah, I've talked myself out of it a couple times. Now, our uh, Cezanne I mentioned, it's um, 30% wheat and 15% spelt. So it's got a high protein content for sure. Yeah. But yeah, to talk a little bit about carbonation, carbonation definitely helps with pairing. And, in, you know, in general, it's something um, we're trying to pay as much attention to as possible because we spun our, our beers. So basically when they're uh, in fermentation, we put a uh, device on them and bung them up. And so it releases only a small amount of CO2 because CO2 is created during fermentation. So we capture a lot of that. So we have beers that are, all of our lager beers are naturally uh, carbonated. So it ends, it lends itself to a softer carbonation. Um, so by the time we move beer from fermenter to, uh, to the bright tanks, we check with our Zama Nagel and it's, you know, two, two, four to two, six. Um, so it's right in, in range of carbonation, but yeah, I mean, that's one thing with, with us and having a canning line, we've had it for about six months. So we're still trying to like, get carb levels really nice because you know for beers like pilsner and you know check style pilsners and um pill lagers in general have a little more carbonation so you want to make sure that you're getting that you know mouthfeel and, and like i said as far as pairings go it, it just helps to like uh you know clear your palate a little bit when you have something that's like crisp and refreshing um so carbonation is wildly important of course and so is uh Especially for something like a, a wheat beer, you know, a wheat beer, it should be carb much higher than a, a Pilsner. It'd be closer to 2.9 or three volumes of CO2. So it's pretty highly carbonated. That would be hard for us to can on our canner. That's the other problem I would have. I'd have to serve it draft only, most likely. Certain canning lines can't handle that high uh, CO2. There's a lot of breakout during the uh, canning process. So do you think that's what I feel like a lot of beers that – when they go into cans, they, they kind of have to fit a certain profile. Is that well, partly the carbonation? Well, yes and no. I mean, you know, like you lose a little bit of CO2 um, that you have in your bright tank when you're actually canning the beer. You'll lose a, a small amount. Um, and there, you know, there's a device called a, a Anton Parr C box, which can measure that once it's in uh, a can. So you can see exactly how much you have. But, you know, we're a 10 barrel brew pub. <laughs> We definitely spend a lot of money uh, with all the equipment we have, but, you know, this device is like a $25,000 piece of equipment. So it's just, you know, again, back to kind of what uh, Paul was saying, you kind of, you know, you use your Zom and Nagel and you use your, your mouth Zom, as some brewers refer to it, and see if it tastes right. But, you know, you can get a beer that seems right and, uh, you know, you get it in the cans and it's a little flabby. And, uh, there's nothing uh, more disappointing than that, for sure. Yeah. 
Hey, let's let's go to another another recipe. I know that Ray was working on. Um, I, I saw that you you have a recipe for New Orleans style barbecue shrimp. Tell us about that dish because about twenty years ago at one of my old restaurants, I had a New Orleans chef, and it's not barbecue that we think of, but it is one of my favorite dishes from New Orleans. Yeah, that that's one of my favorite dishes as well, and. Um, there was a little place on the Jersey shore where the guy was from new Orleans and he had a, a place called the Bayou cafe. And that was the first time that I ever had it. And, um, one day uh, we frequented his restaurant and I said, Hey, you know, what's in that barbecue shrimp? Like we can't get enough of it. It was like, you know, you're <laughs> sopping it up with the bread, all the juices. And I said, but it's not like barbecue. He goes, no, it's, it's all about the sauce. It's a, it's like a barbecue and beer butter. You know, and and that's that's basically the the gist of the sauce. And one day before he ended up closing it, he gave me, you know, pretty much his recipe. And then I've made a bunch of other different recipes, but it's all about the piquant sauce. It's like, you know, um, you're going to pour in your spices and your beer and you're going to reduce it down a little bit. And then you're going to whisk in butter and you're going to make a little slick sauce. And, um, you know, you're going to have all of your delicious uh, and spicy Cajun, uh, spices in there. And, and, um, it, you're going to really flavor up kind of like shrimp don't have a, a ton of flavor on their own, but one trick that you can do is to leave the shells on when you cook this dish and it helps to soak in that, that barbecue butter and, and the beer. So when you peel it off, you're, you, you know, it's kind of messy, but you know, between your fingers and the bread, man, you just can't get enough of this shrimp. And then you definitely want to have good bread and sop up every last. It's it's totally butter. <laughs> yeah, it, it it's it like is. shrimp cooked in butter with this whatever the sauce is. And when you make the sauce, because you, you you've got barbecue butter, I, I I love your your barbecue sauces. I haven't tried the hot sauce yet. Do, oh, do you, you usually it. put some of your sauces in when you're cooking, or 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 in these recipes, are you just building up from the raw ingredients? Um, it depends if, if I'm just, if I'm cooking for, you know, uh, friends and family or, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm constantly putting in, you know, my products and this hot sauce, you've got to try it is, we call it mantra because our daily mantra is to infuse flavor into your everyday life. So it's not like super hot. It's not going to ruin your day. Uh, it's a cayenne red pepper sauce. It's robust, uh, notes of garlic and spice, uh, it, it's to complement your foods. Um, it, as far as when I'm like, you know, recipe testing and like all the recipes for the books and when I do for the, you know, barbecue news magazine, those are, I'm building from scratch. So those require a little bit more testing because I'm not starting with anything that's really pre-made unless it's maybe like for some baking thing, maybe a crust or something, but typically everything is from scratch. So it, it, it does require a little bit more work. Yeah. So, so last year we did the first sauce King NYC competition. You entered your, your Kansas city and your Memphis mop, your two barbecue sauces. So since yeah. then you've, you've rolled out the mantra hot sauce, which I haven't tried. Um, what else? So you, you've, you've also rolled out some rubs. So just as a sauce guy, how is that working for you? Like adding to your product line? The, the, the rubs, so when I, the first sauce I came out with was the Memphis Mop. It's the sweet and tangy. It's my award winner. It's the, the Sauce King NYC Grand Champion. What an honor. I can't thank you and your team enough for ha putting on this, this huge contest in the middle of a pandemic and really giving, you know, barbecue and sauce people something to look forward to. So thank you. That's number one. And number two is I came out with the Memphis and I came out with the belly rub, which is a low sodium all purpose rub. I came out with those two at the same time. And then the next batch was the Kansas City and the Zen steak rub. And then after a couple of years, I didn't want to put out too many products all at once. Um, I don't know how much like with, with the brewers, they're creating their own products. I come up with my products and then I go to a bottler who bottles them in a USDA inspected facility. So it it's a little bit more um it takes a little bit more time for me to come out with a new product because I'm not the one that's physically making it. 
for the masses. Yeah. So uh, it, I wanted to wait a little bit. You know, it costs its time and money. And then we came out with the mantra. And then I have like a slew of barbecue sauces that I'm dying to put out. But like I said, it's time and money. So a little bit at a time. But but I mean, I could put out, you know, five more sauces tomorrow. My goal has always been to grow, but to kind of grow not too fast. I, I'd rather focus on quality versus quantity. So I do have some some sauces that are, are ready to roll um, and, you know, we'll be hopefully rolling them out, you know, uh, as soon as we can. Great. Hey, uh, before we take a short break, I'm going to read off our Beer Haiku of the Week by Awkward <laughs> Haiku. And as an intro, I think that my mistype to him was this show was going to be about grilling beer. <laughs> so his haiku is, that's really dangerous. You misunderstood grilling beers. Take can off the grill. All right. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. This episode is brought to you by Kermit Lynch Wine Merchant, an importer, retailer, and wholesaler of fine wine from France and Italy, headquartered in Berkeley, California. In 1972, Kermit Lynch opened a retail shop in Berkeley, California with a $5,000 loan and a bit of gumption. He started with just 35 cases of wine stacked on the floor. Kermit grew his business from a retailer into a wholesaler and a national importer of wines from France and Italy. These wines are produced by small family growers who are committed to the old world traditions and culture. It is Kermit's belief that great wine is made in the vineyard, not the cellar. Much like his close friends, the late food writer Richard Olney and Chez Panisse's founder Alice Waters, Kermit's influence has been enduring. He has spent nearly half a century shining the spotlight on small artisan producers. Learn more at KermitLynch.com. K-E-R-M-I-T-L-Y-N-C-H.com. Hey, hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Become a member and support us at heritageradionetwork.org. So we're talking about grilling beer or beer and barbecue or just flavors and pairing. Um, we've got, got a great crew here, Ray Sheehan, Paul D., and Todd DiMatteo. Um, so, Todd, back to you. So at, at your Good Word Brewing in, in Duluth, Georgia, like you're also doing a full food program. We were just talking about sauces. Uh, do, do you have a place for sauces on the menu or, or do you have like a range of sauces or you just have like one hot sauce and ketchup? Uh, we actually have a little sauce menu. <laughs> uh, That's what yeah. I was hoping. You just impressed me. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we do. So we do uh, hand cut fries and, you know, we've got, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six. It looks like we have about 12 uh, sauces just for, uh, just for the fries. So, uh, yeah, very involved uh, as far as that goes. But I don't think any of these sauces, actually, I know. No, the, the mustard has beer in it, but nothing else has, uh, you know, mustard as, or uh, beer as part of it besides that do, one. Do you have some, like, Belgian-style, like, mayo sauces for free? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, us, run, run us through. What, what are some of the sauces you have? Okay, so we've got a burger sauce, a chili oil, uh, of course, your buffalo sauce. We have a sesame uh, gochu chang, which is a uh, as Korean inspired. Of course, your buttermilk ranch. We are in the south. Um, we've got a uh, remoulade. Uh, we've got, a, of course, our own barbecue sauce, a Calabrian mayonnaise, and then a country mustard, black garlic aioli, and then a honey mustard. So yeah, quite the saucier uh, at Good Word. So when we're talking about you know just preparing with food, um, like what what what. Let's pick one item off your menu that would go with either the remoulade or another sauce. It might, be, it might be. Is is it already served? Is the sauce served with the dish on the menu, or you have your choice? Uh, no, those, those are those are more or less like you know you can fries and they're served with uh, you know a choice of those sauces. But I'll tell you what my favorite thing is on the menu. It's our handmade yoki, uh, and that's served with braised pork cheek, uh, black truffle fondue, which we make in house. And a kale and uh, Calabrian chili salad, and like a little farm egg shaved on top. It sounds, uh, hopefully, it sounds delicious, but it, it sounds simple. But it is so rich, even though this dish is like you know relatively small. It's 
freaking phenomenal. I love it. It's probably my favorite thing we have. Um, oh, but man. everything's got this country. It sounds. I use the word country because I think of it, countryside cooking, and my favorite country is like Italy. <laughs> sounds pretty good. Yeah. It's um, been- so, what beer would you pair with that? So that that's uh, I'm down at Good Word Brewing. I got the yeah. gnocchi. You're having gnocchi. I would say our Dai Tai Dai, which is our five uh, percent American South Pilsner. Yeah, really good. It's, like I said it's crisp, and even though this dish is uh, it's a little heavy, that uh, Pilsner will you know cut all that fat really nicely. Um, it's it's a pretty dry pils. Um, I'm actually drinking one right now, but I'm not eating yet because we're closed. But uh, that would pour, that would pair perfectly. Yeah. Hey, about your pilsners, um, you sent me the any day now, the Italian style pills a collab with Blackberry Farm. Yeah, and that was really one of my favorite beers of the spring. Nice, thank you. And two things about it, I was talking to a couple other brewers a couple weeks ago, and they almost mocked. Well, what's why is it Italian style pills? You know, not everyone's drinking Tebow pills. So what is it about Italian style pills? I think they also said that it's pop- becoming more popular in California. Yeah, so I mean, really, you could just call it a dry hop German style pilsner. But uh, so yeah, uh, Brifico from their Italian brewery, they have a style that's uh, called Tipo pills, which is like I think it translates to like sort of pills, but it's a dry <laughs> hop. it's a dry hop pilsner um, style beer. So yeah, I mean, there's two schools of thoughts, on, you know, thought on that. Like, yeah, it's just dry hop German style pills. Um, so yeah, I don't know if they don't agree with it or mock it. I don't, like, I don't care. <laughs> but uh, but in my opinion, you know, I you know my last name is DiMatteo. You know, so Italian heritage. The malt is a uh, Vireman Ericlea grown on the coast of Italy. So that's Italian, and uh, why not? So yeah, and what Hallertau hops is that what you use? So the the hops come from uh, Sites Farms, which is located in Hallertau. So there are definitely not Italian uh, hops, but uh, like I said, the malt is grown right on the coast of Italy. So the cool thing about that malt, I guess, like I said, it's it's brought in by uh, Vireman, but it's called Ericlea. It's got this really cool like minerality to it, um, and actually the the hue of the beer, the the color is like it's it's slightly green tint. It's kind of it's super unique. This is the only like I, I use Vireman exclusively in our um our pale lagers, but I only use Ericlea in that um that beer. But uh it's uh it's definitely one of my favorites too. I, did I send you some of that Heater Allen collab we just did? It's called oh, No, I'd awesome. love to love to try it, man. Yeah, it's another so I call it, that one's a dry hop pilsner too, but you call it a dry hop pilsner. But that one's dry hop with another uh, Sites uh, Hallertau um, hop called Saphir. That one's got a little more herbal character, but it's probably one of my favorite. They're very different, the two, uh, the two beers, even though they're similar um, uh, in a lot of ways. The, the Heater Allen is Bohemian uh, malt from, from Virus, a little more pale, but super crisp. But yeah, I'll send you some of that too, Kevin. Oh, that's great, man. Hey, I'm, and I'm going to go back to Ray. Ray, um, just a general concept. Um, I know with this, you're working with the ceramic cookers. And you mentioned that there's a difference between, we, we kind of get confused. You know, everyone's been talking about it's barbecue, is not grilling. And, and we've had everyone focusing on low and slow and what you do with an offset smoker. But we know there's a lot more to cooking than just that. So I like you're talking about grilling with getting like a char versus low and slow. And give us an overview of how that affects flavor. Well, if you're grilling, you're typically cooking uh, usually smaller cuts of meat at a hotter uh, temperature and a faster you know, amount of time. Um, so you're going to build that that little bit of crust very quickly at a high heat. It's almost going to, it's going to sear it onto, onto the meat. If you're doing the smoking, you're cooking low and slow. So a, a bigger cut of meat, a lower temperature for a longer period of time. When you do it for a longer period of time like that, um, particularly with your dry rub, you're going to, you're going to be able to have that dry rub almost, uh, the sugars in it will caramelize onto the meat and you'll be able to build layers of flavor between 
you know, your dry rub and any glaze that you start to put on towards the end of cooking. Um, you know, in Memphis, you know, ribs are, you know, um, if they do mop them, they're mopping them throughout building those layers of flavor. So you're, my point is you're doing it at a, at a lower temperature and it's going to really help you build that bark, that crust that, that we all crave, you know? And you feel like that, that was, you know, this weekend's coming, Memorial Day weekend. I know you're coming up. We're doing an event, uh, Five Borough Picnic at cookoutnyc.com in New York. And I'm um, really thrilled that you're coming up to showcase your Thank Sauce you. King Award winning sauces. But um, there's going to be a mix there. You know, there, there's ribs. There'll be, let's talk about ribs because there'll be many of the chefs will have cooked ribs. Mm. And whether they're cooking them on site slow or they're cooking them at, they're restaurant slow and bringing them in. So they're all doing slow cooked ribs. It's, it's no one's doing it. Right. Like I've done Italian recipes where I've braised it in a pan with white wine and sage. And that's not what people think about ribs, but um, how, how would you do what, what, what's a good rib, rib recipe that you have from any of your books? I mean, you know, there's so many different rubs out there, you know, uh, so if you pick your favorite rub, I like to season them about an hour before I put them on the cooker. Um, just so the, the rub has time to like set up and almost start to melt into the meat. Um, but they're so thin, there's not so much meat. Like I wouldn't season them the night before, like a, like a brisket or a pork butt. I would give them an hour, an hour and a half before they go on the smoker. Um, and really they're going to get in two hours, they're really going to pick up in about two and two and a half hours, as much smoke as they're going to get. There is such a thing as over smoking. You don't want to, <laughs> you know, you don't want it to, you don't want the person to bite into it. And all they taste is this acrid smoke. So probably, you know, you want to use the salt, the smoke, like salt and pepper, like as another seasoning. So about two hours on the smoke. Um, for me, I like to wrap them and I'll, in my wrap, I'll put, I'll put my mantra hot sauce. You can put your favorite hot sauce, uh, honey, brown sugar, some more rub, a little apple juice, wrap them, put them back on the cooker for another hour to an hour and a half. And then after that time, I check the temperature and the, and the, basically the bendability of it. I'm looking to see that they're a little bit pliable. I'll take them out of the, of the wrap and then put them back on the smoker. And then I'm going to start to glaze them for the last half hour. And, you know, cause you don't want the, the barbecue sauce to burn up on the smoker, but it's going to really um, help it set the glaze for the last half hour. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for um, a bite with a little bit of a tug. I don't want it to be falling off the bone. If you, if you're like falling off the bone and you're not in your own backyard, they're overcooked. <laughs> you know, when you're at home, that's one thing. But when I feel like when you're feeding, you know, uh, people or it's a competition, the, the judges typically like to uh, have a little bit of a tug. But that's pretty much, you know, the simplest, the easiest recipe, uh, you know, that I could think of. Yeah. Well, yeah, you mentioned flavor and you mentioned smoke as a flavor. So let's go back to Paul. So, Paul, uh, I think your Hell's, Hell's Smoke Porter was one of the first beers I ever had of yours. I also had your potato stout years ago. Yeah. So how do, how do I mean, we've talked about smoke beers a lot, but from your perspective, how do you use smoke as a flavor in beer? It, it depends on the um, style. Like the, the Hell's Smoke Porter, I will smoke about 20% of the barley to, that I'll be brewing with over a combination of apple and alder wood. I do a, um, a smoked uh, wit beer. I smoke maybe just like 12% of the wheat over mesquite. And then there's the Vlad, the inhaler, which is a Drodzitsky. That's 100% of everything I'm brewing with, I smoke over oak. Um, so it depends on the style that you're going for. Um, to echo what Ray was talking about, I generally will smoke only for about two hours to two, two and a half hours um, when I'm smoking the malt. But it's um, it's not for everyone, but people who like smoke and who like beer and who like smoke beers so far, Knockwood, they've been they've been enjoying what I've been doing. Do you, do you feel like when, when you you're adding smoke malt to your beer, do you think that 
the, you can use less hops. Does, do, does, do you feel like it does the same for the mouthfeel that hops does? That, that's a good question. I, you know, none of the styles that I'm doing the smoked beers for are particularly hoppy beers. I mean, a porter uh, is not a, a, a is very is that much hops in a porter or a wit beer. Although you, you know you've got some spices in a wit beer. Uh, the Grzitski has maybe more hops than the other two. Um, I've never tried to do a hoppier style as a smoked beer. I guess uh, that's something to play with. But, um, I mean, hops are going to give you bitterness and maybe some citrus or fruit or whatever else, depending on the, on the hop variety. Smoke is just kind of its own thing. Yeah, and I'm just going to give mention to the – for me, one of the classics, the, the Schlenkel, the Helles Lager – it yes. gets it gets that hint of smoke because it's 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 apparently run through the the same. It, it's brewed, yeah, it's brewed in the same system that they that they brew the that they so it gets a, it picks up it. that hint of smoke, yeah. which which on, it, on my palate comes off. It, it it picks up the flavor a little bit. I don't know. I yeah. don't know how to describe it either, but um, that's good. And let's let's go back to to Todd about. I want to talk about collaborations because. That any day now pills was with Blackberry Farm. I just saw you were working on a recipe or inspiration from Elvina in in Belgium. Tell us about your collaborations and where your inspirations come from. Oh yeah, so we're doing a beer, or actually I brewed it. Uh, what last week maybe? It's a uh, a collab with um, Dan from Wooden Robot and Yvonne Deb- uh, Debates from uh, De La Seine. Oh, De La Seine, not Ovina, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Um, but, you know, we're all big fans of uh, English beer, so we, we made a, a simple English bitter, and we're going to do a light dry hop on it with some Brambling Cross. But, uh, you know, I, I'm a big English beer fan, and I can't remember if I sent you our um, English, English beer. beer. Yeah, so we, we've got three, we have three or four um, core English beers. And I say four because I, I'm pretty sure that this uh, De La Seine collab is going to be pretty pretty outstanding. But um, we've got a beer called Analog Life, which is a 3.4% uh, dark, mild, um, super traditional. Uh, you guys talking bitterness. That one's pretty low. That one's about 16 BUs. Then we've got another one called Digital Comforts. That one's 3.8%, um, and it's a, uh, a best bitter. So it'll have a nice malty, like toffee um, flavor. and not super sweet for sure, and it has a nice little um, bitterness charge. It's about 25 IBUs. And then the Quantum Immortality, which is the 4% English mod we were talking about. So it's a, a really rich beer up front, but it finishes pretty, you know, it finishes dry for an English beer, but not crazy dry. And then, like I said, the De La Sin beer, we haven't quite named yet, but we're working on a label. And that one's going to be around um, 4 to 4.2%. But Anyway, you're talking about collabs. I mean, so obviously doing collabs with people that can come in and make a beer is the way you want to do it. Um, typically, um, especially through COVID, we've done lots of uh, virtual collabs. But, you know, for the most part, brewers have, you know, talked via Zoom or via email or text or whatever and sorted out the recipe. So the hard, the quote unquote hard part is done, <laughs> even though the brew day is, you know, six to eight hours or whatever it's going to be, uh, depending on style. But, um, you know, that's kind of where you're like, all right, do I want to brew the beer before the brewery gets here? Do I want to brew it the day of? I kind of just, you know, if I'm going to a collab, I let them kind of, you know, host me however they want. And if they're coming here, I always ask, do you want to be part of the brew day? Would you rather um, me knock it out before or after? Um, you guys come to town and let's just hang out and have fun. So it's really that camaraderie kind of spirit that goes on. And we definitely hope that Yvonne can make it out, um, you know, later this year, uh, if we rebrew this beer, you know, Dan and I even talked about going over to Belgium and visiting him, but yeah, we, we do, we do a lot of collabs, you know, we, before the pandemic and even a little during, I traveled lightly, uh, as safe as I possibly could. But I mean, you know, even though I've got three kids at the house, my wife is pretty patient. I just, you know, I load up the truck with some beer and try to do an event when I go to a new state and town and, you know, try to make friends along the way. You know, you can, can do a lot of things, but making beer is definitely a, 
a fun job and it's a, it's a good way to and create like fellowship with other uh, like-minded folks. So, no, you're doing a great job, Todd. Thank you. And then Ray, um, for you, you know, you, you've also done barbecue competitions. Um, d- does that feel like a collaboration when, when you're doing a barbecue competition? I don't know. I'm thinking about a Memphis mop collaboration now. I don't know. <laughs> um, that way my customers could, could drink it, you know, instead of putting it on stuff. Um, <laughs> as far as uh, the barbecue competitions, um, you know, as far as a collaboration, not really. Be- if It's more like fellowship um, and like the barbecue community steps up whenever you need something kind of thing. Um, but as far as a collaboration, not in the same way. No, not, not, not the same. No, it, it wouldn't be because you're kind of, you're all, you know, kind of heading for the same goal, but you're kind of, you know, at each other's throats. But then if something were to happen, you would help them out in a heartbeat. So it's, it's, it's more about the fellowship and the, and the, the sense of community, you know? Yeah. No, that's great. The well, last thing I'm going to ask you is tell us a little more about the the beer queso that that recipe you're working on. You know, what is, how would you make a beer queso? First, how do you make a queso? I mean, I've had some some weird ones, but I know what it's supposed to be. It's really, you know, this this recipe's uh, again. I'm really trying to focus on the on a lot of the basics for someone that just gets a Kamado style cooker. Um, I'm trying not to give them stuff that's too complicated, but I really want to introduce a lot of great flavors. Like you're going to see flavors from all over the world in this book. Uh, and on top of that, some really great barbecue flavors and recipes. Um, as far as the queso goes, uh, this is a really super simple recipe. Um, you kind of put everything in a cast iron skillet or a Dutch oven. Um, all your favorites really, you know, uh, Colby Jack cheese, cheddar cheese, any kind of cheese that's like really that melts easily. Um, and then I I like to use uh, like smoked sausage. So I'll saute smoked sausage and break it up in, so it's ground like crumbles. And then that goes into the pot with green chilies, sweet onion, uh, some barbecue rub, maybe some rotel, some cilantro, some jalapeno, you know, uh, a really, uh, a really delicious beer. And it just goes in and it goes right on the smoker and then you stir it up and in about a half hour, 45 minutes, magic happens. And you just, you know, you're just dipping everything in it. Pretzels, you know, soft pretzels, tortilla chips. It's just kind of okay, like a fun is like party the ultimate, thing. ultimate dip, almost like a fondue. Right. It's not supposed to be soupy and it's, it's right. It's you not want supposed it, to be like a um, cheese whiz or something. Right. You want it to coat the back of a spoon. You know, you don't want it to be like soupy. You don't want it to be watery, but you don't want it to be super thick either. You know? Yeah. I, I always assumed that queso would be like that because I, I had some Mexican friends who were chefs one time we went to a, a, a I'm not going to name it. All I'm going to tell you is that the reason I said soupy is that we had one. I swear to God, it was like cheese soup out of a can. And uh, that's not queso. So I want to keep the standard side. Because when, when, I, when I see queso at a restaurant, I want it to, I want it to come out the, the, something like that you would make, Ray. So let's keep setting the standards. I'm going to have to break off soon because I know our engineer's got to go. I want to just give a shout out, Ray Sheehan, when his new book comes out, which might be when, the fall or in 2022? It's looking what like uh, they have it listed on Amazon right now for March 29th so uh, of 22. So I'll tell you what, just put that, you know, beer bar owners and brewery owners, I would get that book because you will have enough really great recipes for your 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 tavern or or bar or beer menu, uh, I'm not. I'm, I didn't mean it, Ray. That the, the the different you know dishes like just doing a barbecue shrimp New Orleans style and crab cakes and everything else you're talking about. To me, that that's the ultimate uh, beer and food pairing right there. Um, also, going to shout out this weekend. It's it's, it's your, this is an evergreen show, meaning you're going to listen to it for a long time. But um, some barbecue people like. Pig farmer Tank Jackson is really into cider pairing, and I know he's been working with the Spanish style cedra. Um, that's that's also exciting too. So 
you know, food pairing is just, it's just, you're just touching the surface, right, Todd? We're just touching the surface. Um, but like anything, you got to eat a lot and drink a lot. <laughs> That's um, good. So, and I want to thank everybody. Ray, good luck with the book. Looking forward to seeing you at, at our event. Thank um, you. Todd, thank you again. And and Paul, one more time, man, you've been inspiring me for many years with, with your great beer out of your little brew house in Long Island. So awesome. thanks for joining yeah, thanks, us. Thank, thank you, Jimmy. All right. So big shout out to Armin Spengen, our engineer, Caroline Fox, our producing intern. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host here on Beer Sessions Radio. We'll catch you next time. All right, guys. Thank you. Woo. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like. Tell your friends and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network, wherever you listen to podcasts.